key point because the demining, although it drags on for years and years in, in many countries, is sort of a finite problem, which is different from education or other development issues like public health. Um, and so that really does frame the question for a donor about resources. Do you, do you, do you continue throwing lots and lots of money to slowly uh, develop a capacity that you don't necessarily have full confidence in, or do you spend a lot less money and just get the problem solved? And that's, uh, that's an important part of the, of the landscape from a donor's point of view. The question is, who's your client? I mean, mainly, is it local government, is it international organization, is it UN, is it, who's the typical client for your services? I guess local we have, community? We have, two, we have two clients. Uh, one of the local communities, much less so than the national government, the, the local communities. What we try, and, and the other clients are donors, because we have to serve them and, 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 uh, and show them the results. And we have, to, we have to work with them to the extent that our agendas overlap with theirs. So in terms of local communities, we really go and try in every country to go out and find out where, where the mines problem is and who are being most affected and who are being least served. And that's where, where we go. So even to the extent that a government gets involved in, in, in doing demining, it's often for big infrastructure projects, roads, uh, uh, actually it's usually roads, uh, in, looking at it go in Afghanistan, certainly, uh, power substations and, and that sort of thing. But the villagers who are stuck in mined villages and there are no resources on the horizon at all, that's where we go. So we try, there are, in our mindset, there are clients, although they, they don't have a lot of power in the situation, but we try to navigate the other uh, uh, actors who may consider themselves our clients or certainly have, have influence or power over what we do. We can't operate in a country where we don't have legal authority by the host of the country. Focused on the on those communities, and then we are focused on the ones who are writing the checks, which are mostly governments, U.S. government, British government, mm -hmm. Dutch government, etc. And most of them are through sort of an in independent kind of program. We think demining the world is a good thing in and of itself, uh, uh, and and so we have a separate kind of fund for it. Uh, what gets tricky is if you have you know a government that's trying to sort of push certain foreign policy goals and. See, it was a lot of money for Afghanistan and not so much money for Angola these days. I wanted to maybe add something about timelines um, because I think and you made a really good point and I used to sort of think the war is over, we're done, but then you have maimings and deaths. But then after that, even after we get these landmines cleared, there's some of the statistics that Chime was talking about, which is the cost, the sort of the expense and sort of the having to live with these injuries. <coughs> going forward for another generation. And I think that it's really important that you know we not only focus on clearing the mines, although obviously that's of key importance, but also then working with these communities to make sure that their rights and their needs are still taken care of after they've been maimed or killed. I know that, um, so I think that really investing in civil society, especially when it comes to disability advocacy, is really important. Um, and I think that if you start that now as well, sort of while this process is ongoing, if you have groups of landmine victims or parents of landmine victims who are advocating for, you know, even things like access ramps to schools, access to government buildings, if they're more visible in the community, that's going to put this grassroots pressure on the government as well to address the landmines issue faster and also to really consider what this means going forward for the cost to their government and the support that they're going to have because they're going to have this segment of the population that is disabled and is going to have, it's going to be a much more difficult population to be working with and taking care of, sort of even looking further down the line. Um, so I actually, I was wondering sort of how, have you seen the emergence of, or disability advocacy to any extent that coincides with this. I mean, I think that might help put pressure on the military as well if you sort of think it's not just the mines. What are you going to do with all these people hurt afterwards and sort of these communities then pressuring the government to act faster both right now and also to take their needs into consideration when the government continues to make you know, decisions about their, um, their social services. I've certainly seen a lot of advocacy going on, a lot of it external. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> there are a lot of programs, UN has a lot of programs to try and develop a culture of 
rights for people with disabilities. And for a long time, there's been a special focus on landmine victims. And recently, there's more of a kind of pendulum shift to consider, well, landmine victims are different than other people with disabilities. Let's, let's make mm -hmm. a broader culture about disabilities. Amputees are a huge um, uh, pressure group in Colombia, for example, because a lot of them are soldiers. The soldiers have stepped on, on mines. They continue to work. Uh, you know, they get desk jobs. They're, 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 you know, they're treated well, uh, but they are, you know, they're, they're inside the system. So they are, a, they're very visible uh, because they're, you go to a, a Colombian military base and you will see a lot of amputees. Uh, they, 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 uh, but by, by, because they're so visible in the system, they are able to kind of be a voice for, for, uh, uh, for the rights of amputees, although they have much better results for soldiers than they do for, for, for civilians. Um, in every country it's different, it's, but, but yeah, there's a lot of stigmatization that she may talked about going on in, 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 in many of the countries uh, for people with disabilities in general, uh, in my, my countries in particular. Can I, I'm going to have to go, but I wanted to, I think we're just getting going. Being candid with ourselves, we should have shut down after 20 minutes of the presentations. Mm -hmm. Give us the written stuff. We put it up on the website, mm -hmm. and we can have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. That's what we're deficient here, is we have time for the dialogue. Now we'll just begin to peel the artichoke, okay? mm -hmm. but we'll figure out a way to come back. <laughs> a couple of observations. There was a book that was written many years ago called On What is Learned in School. <laughs> and what's fascinating about it, it was Lerner who did it, is that you know most people focus on the content, the curriculum. But there's also the, if you will, the, the anthropology, the psychology of how the school's organized. I mean, there's no accident that you have a school organized based on 19th century notions of production. <laughs> there is a reason why I have to teach you to distinguish between role occupant and occupant. Okay? Now, you don't realize this until you go into a society that is broken down. And assumptions you've made, and you just go to certain societies where civil war is broken down, and for a generation there was no education. So people don't even understand the concept of a rational bureaucracy which underpins so much of what we do. So what we ought to do is to get some people to think about what's the most effective way of removing line, lines. So at the end result, that community, you showed us a picture, when they moved in, they feel some sense of empowerment. How was that actually done? Because it may very well be that that's what you build on. Because there are dozens of problems, whether it's malaria, landmines, etc. I can just go down, and that's our problem. Every month it's Baskin Robbins, give me a flavor. I'll tell you a, a sad story. Now, embedded in that model, by the way, is the victim only gets services as long as the victim declares he or she's a victim. And that's the problem with most of our aid programs, because it begins with, I'm the expert. I wrote the policy. I'm then the expert. I hire my middle class friend to design a program. Distribute the program, so if two cents on the dollar ever gets into that shanty town, I'm remark I'm, re I'm, I'm absolutely, it's remarkable. Because it's supported all the salaries of my friends and, and families and middle class people. So is there a way to get some young people to think, uh, and some old people to think about alternative ways? The model of advocacy is based on the West, it's based on a number of other assumptions. That may not work in other societies. So in the case of Colombia, what do we deal with indigenous populations as well as Afro-Colombians who have been maimed, who have been moved off the land, for political reasons, so you have to see this in the context. Well, it may very well be that as the country of Colombia decides its future is based on extractive industries, and they're going to have to negotiate agreements with huge mining companies in South Africa and elsewhere, that you negotiate that portions of money are set aside to deal with certain social issues. That's the way you begin to create enough capital. But if, in fact, you just tax the companies and the capital to run the same old programs, trust me, it'll work for two or three years. Some people get good jobs. You'll probably hire some of the best public servants out of the government. 
to work in your nonprofit organization. Three years later, you're out of there, and that collapses, and then somebody else has to come back in as an NGO. Only this time, we can even bring some nice Afropolitans. Oh, yes. <laughs> is, it, is, is that, that yeah. would make me feel a little bit better? Well, I don't know. Maybe not. In any case, the point is that how do we begin to sustain discussions about alternative models that begin with something that's very specific and concrete? Remove that mind. From that, how do we ask ourselves, what were the patterns of human encounter that we used that empowered people not only to remove the mind, but came out of it with their dignity intact? as opposed to, I was a helpee, and you helped me. I don't read that, I don't hear that being discussed, and generally for the people who are being uh, helped, their voices are silent. And their voices are silent in terms of, well, what is it that seems to work that we might, we might want to do? And the last thing I would say is that young people talk about technology and Facebook, etc., get some people to seriously think about the implications of ICT, I like the idea, GIS, phone, uh, and other, it may very well be that somebody not too long ago is going to give you brand, uh, broadband, width, that you could go in and give you telephones to the right people who are designing those nice programs that not only removed the mines, but then they build that school that you described, and they were involved in the school, and the young people are beginning to see themselves in slightly different ways. I think those are the discussions that we need to have, and we're not having. Okay. So, uh, I have to leave, but under no circumstances should you interpret that as an act of lack of interest, or asking you to leave. Uh, I would hope that, that uh, you all would linger and talk and continue the discussion. I know that Pac has some ideas about how we can harvest the discussion we've had here. And if we could get your written comments, we could put those up on the website. And now that becomes background reading to continue the discussion, because I suspect that the concreteness and attractiveness of demining may be a way to engage people from other sectors, from other uh, special interests, from other advocacy groups to be able to say, you know, if we sort of co-labor here, maybe we can sequence some things and we will create a greater impact. And I think that that's, uh, and it gets back to many of the points that John is making in terms of even a broader philosophic that we can begin to sort of hammer out to suggest that, that we are more than just about another event or another series of uh, activities, but really trying to find a way for some sort of sustained, focused, coherent description of a world that's better that we deserve to live in and how we should go about organizing ourselves and being able to achieve that whether it's in the area of health education or, you know, health peace or whatever. Uh, I thank you all, and uh, Lena, I'll turn it back over to you. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about is we did not discuss the 8,000 HALO staff. 8,000 people employed by HALO, they are from their local community, so they are active participants in addressing the problem. They are trained at every from every level, from the D-minor to the logisticians, to the medics, to the technicians, everyone. They're Angolans, most of the Indians, um, Somalis. Now, what happens when they've been engaged in that community, they've owned their issue, and they've participated in the effective removal of the landmines, then, as you mentioned, that NGO, in this case, Halo, is done. We have to move on. What happens with the skill capacity that we've developed? What is the next step? And as we come closer to closer this discussion, I want us to talk about the next step after that. When HALO has reached some kind of an end state, we have impacted lives within that community. And now, where are they to go and how can they continue to empower themselves, as Chime said? So that's what I want to throw out, and that's what I want the discussion to move on to next. Yeah, I, I, I guess 
saying a, a different point of view um, about landmines. Um, the assumption is that it's all the military fault. The war in Vietnam started in 1962. I guarantee you. I was in Laos and Cambodia in 1959. I wasn't on vacation. <laughs> you know, on Labor Day 1959, I was in the military service. On Monday morning, Labor Day, I went to a base. They took me to Sears and Gopa. I bought $250 worth of civilian clothes. On Wednesday, we were going into Laos. Now, if you ask the military, the war started in 1962. Who put us there in 1959? You know, the military goes to work for other people. And so that's why I think your community learning the process. That we have to have that discussion because there's a lot of things that get related that you have to go back and think through. The minute the French lost in Vietnam, the United States went into Vietnam. I can tell you because I was there. Okay, I was a young man. Um, I got drafted nine days after I graduated from college. Okay, you don't have to draft anymore. We would change some of our attitudes about this landmine situation if we figured out what the relationships that you talked about started out. Do we understand the system? and then working our way through so that it's not just the military where we lay the blame for landmines. You know what I mean? Some people that never put on a uniform made the decision to go into Vietnam. And some people that never put on a uniform made the decision to start some of these wars that we now pay for. And we've got to have that discussion at that level, and I think that that's where young people, um, you know, the Vietnam War, the young people got in, into the Vietnam War in the late 60s and all that, and the war stopped. And when the war stopped, the young people stopped. We need somebody, the young people, to keep right on running. When the war stopped, it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. And we need the young people to keep right on going so when you get to be 76 like I am now, Okay, that some of these problems that we started when I was 26 get solved. And so that's what I would leave at the table. Uh, you know, I would leave at the table that young people don't stop just because somebody signed the declaration and said this is over, because it's not. We continue to learn and we continue to build community. And we can only do that through our educational system. <clears throat> we teach kids in school today how to make hamburgers, you know. You know, we teach them, we, we turn it out technicians. We're not turning out educated people anymore in college. We turn it out technicians. You learn how to make something run. You know, I was an architect, city planner. I knew how to build them. I know how to build buildings. But you know, I never took philosophy. I never took these human kinds of things that made me think about what happens inside a building or outside a building, why these things work. Because we didn't have to, because we only turned out traditions. And we need to get people back into some of what I call the soft sciences, the human sciences, in order to understand why we have some of the problems that we have. Thank you. I have a question. <laughs> yeah, uh, my name is Susan Altman. Um, it's, from what you said, it sounded like a number of minefields are along borders, like Cambodia, um, Thailand. I know there were a lot of mines planted during the Iraq Iran war along that border. I'm assuming they're still there. And you're talking about along the Zimbabwe border. And what I'd like to know is, to what extent are those nations, which may still not be on very good terms with each other, willing to help in removing the mines, or do they want to keep the mines there? Because they regard that as uh, helping to maintain their own security. That's a great question. I'm going to, I'm going to flip it to Kurt. I just walked back in. Yes. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> all these
these all these minefields yes. are on the border. Just to sure. To what extent does that complicate efforts of countries that keep the border, keep the border in mind? Yeah, I mean, it's it is a it is a, an issue and, and a very and one that we will need to consider in Zimbabwe and Mozambique when we actually are able to clear some of those border minefields. Um, you know. As far as the people living on those border areas are concerned, I would say the same probably goes for the Thai and Cambodians living, communities living on those borders. They don't pay much attention to the borders. It's, it's not sort of, we are Cambodians and we are Thais. Uh, you know, it's, you find uh, in Mozambique and Zimbabwe, you know, we, we saw some schools right on the border, literally minefields just close by, where the students were from Mozambique and classes were in English or Portuguese, depending on which side you're on. Um, but uh, the, the, the I, guess what I'm I don't think that is to what extent uh, is it would do, these governments do they be want helpful it? in helping to clear and supporting efforts there? To what extent sure. do they oppose it? Are yeah, they happy to keep the minds there? Yeah, I think I think the answer for Zimbabwe and Mozambique is that the governments would be happy to see them gone, and they will. I anticipate that they will work together. It's hard to say with the government in Zimbabwe what will actually come of it, but I mean the Zimbabweans, with their limited resources, are trying to tackle this massive mines problem, and the Mozambican government is very com committed to ta tackling the Mozambican uh, mines problem. The gray area is that there are some questions about the delineation of the border. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how tense things are between those two governments because it, the discussion's never really been finished. Uh, you know, those mines on those borders were laid by the Rhodesians starting in the 70s. And, you know, their idea of the border may not be, you know, in line with what it is today. Uh, certainly in Cambodia and Thailand, I think there is some. Uh, there is some, you know, will within the government to keep these mines right. on the border, uh, simply because there, you know, it's it's uh, there's tensions between certain uh, temples and border areas between those two countries, and and you know it's come to a point where you know troops have gathered right on the border, uh, and and we've been prevented from clearing mines uh, simply because until this border issues there are um, so, so resolved, uh, you know, uh, they want the mines to stay. Right. So I think, you know, I think that... But there's other cases like Somaliland and Ethiopia <coughs> share a big desert border. And, if, and because of our other experience with Double this be tricky, we, we sent a mission to the Ethiopian uh, you know, Mine Action Authority who said, you know, we're clearing these communities on the Somaliland side, but the borders kind of straddle wherever, the, the, the minefields straddle the borders, and they basically said, clear whatever you want, just yeah. let us know where you are. So it's case by case, I guess. Yeah, and I, and I would imagine that if, you know, Mugabe's government in Zimbabwe is quite difficult to deal with, but if that were to change, then I think that any, you know, hurdles that we could expect to encounter with the Zimbabwe and Mozambique would disappear, so it's just, you know, it's... Well, sort of I was wondering to what thing. extent there might be possible to put pressure on certain governments to work together. The State Department would like well, to get together. Well, we, we are hopefully going to be we are hopefully going to be experiencing. We're hopefully going to be moving forward because we we have our eyes set on Zimbabwe, uh, and you know we'll see how that goes. And, and I think that you know pressuring it is a job for the State Department. It's a job for the State Department, you know, or other political players. <laughs> I think we have. I'm sorry. I think we have space for one more question. It's 2:15. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. Well, if, if there are other people around, obviously, if you want to ask any, any more questions, uh, and certainly, if, um, we did mention social media, and Halo is trying to to build up its presence on the, uh, in the internet and things like that, so do check us out on Facebook, Twitter. Mm -hmm.